The committee commenced consideration of Bill C-21, an act to amend certain acts and to make certain consequential amendments uh, firearms. And we have witnesses, um, uh, Rob Stewart, Deputy Minister, uh, Talal Dekalbab, Assistant, C Assistant Deputy Minister, Canadian Border Services Agency, Fred Gaspar, Vice President, and with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Deputy Commissioner Brian Larkin, uh, as well as Kelly Paquette, De Director General. Please note that the Minister and the Deputy Minister will be with us for the first hour, and, and the remaining officials will stay for the second hour in order to answer questions from members. Uh, with, with all that, uh, welcome to all, and I now invite Minister Mendicino to make an opening statement. The scourge of gun violence, which has been impacting uh, our country now for, for many, many years, and signal to this committee that it is up to us as parliamentarians to work together to reverse the alarming trends that have seen increases in gun violence, specifically in handgun violence. It is up to this committee not only to study carefully uh, sensible laws which are designed uh, with the intent of reversing those trends, but to also discuss the efforts that we are taking to stop the illegal trafficking of guns uh, at our borders. And it is up to the members of the committee to support the work of Parliament in examining the root causes of gun crime, uh, which um, require us to work very closely with many partners, including grassroots organizations, uh, so that we can stop gun crime before it starts. And I look to uh, you and uh, to the various perspectives that you will be bringing from your uh, own constituencies uh, to have a, th a thoughtful discussion about that today. Um, it is clear, wherever you sit, regardless of the side of the aisle, or partisan stripe, that the status quo won't do. And uh, every time I meet with someone who has lost a loved one or is, who has been harmed by violence, that we owe it to them to do more. And these are far and away the most difficult conversations that I have in my capacity as a member of parliament. I've um, had the, the privilege of speaking with the families of uh, the victims uh, from Porta Pic in Truro in Nova Scotia, from the Quebec City Mosque, uh, from Polytechnique, uh, from the Toronto Danforth in my hometown. And um, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about them. Not a single day. And it is uh, a singular motivation for me uh, in this job to try to find a way to ensure that those tragedies don't ever occur again. And it's a complex problem. There are no easy or simple solutions to eradicating gun crime. I readily acknowledge that. But from where I sit and from where the government sits, uh, we need a comprehensive strategy. And that strategy is composed of a number of pillars. One, smart laws. From where we sit, assault-style rifles have no place in our communities. Point final. Uh, that's why we banned them two years ago, and that's why we're in the throes of implementing a buyback program which will get assault-style rifles out of our communities once and for all. We need smart laws like Bill C-21, which, among other things, will introduce a national handgun freeze, which will introduce red flag and yellow flag, flag protocols to reverse the trend in the connection between domestic violence and gender-based violence and the presence of gun, which has gone up tragically over the last number of years. We need uh, a bill that will provide additional tools to fight organized crime. And one of the things that Bill C-21 will do when passed into law is it will increase maximum sentences from 10 to 14 years for those hardened criminals who would try to terrorize our communities with guns, as well as providing additional surveillance tools to law enforcement so that we can interdict those individuals who are trying to traffic guns, whether it's in our communities or at the borders. This bill does all that. It also ensures that uh, we deal with the challenges around straw purchasing so that criminals uh, can be stopped from trying to use alternate individuals to purchase their guns lawfully and then have them transferred to them. And, um, and there's much more in there. 
and I know that we're going to uh, dig into some other substantive issues, but it is important that we study this bill. It is important that we take the steps that are necessary to stop the growth of a universe of uh, guns and handguns, which has now become the number one type of gun used in homicides in the country. And that's not all we're doing. Uh, I have said on, on many occasions uh, at this committee, in the House of Commons, in public, that this government is invested in reinforcing our borders. Depuis les dernières années, nous avons investi... Over the past uh, year, we have spent over $321 million to enhance our borders. This is an investment that gives the RCMP and the Border Services Agency with more uh, tools. We work with our American partners. We have good cooperation there. I know that this is a challenge. I know that despite all of the progress that we have achieved at the border, that we have to do even more. And I'm always ready to work with all colleagues here at this committee and even in the House to come up with other concrete solutions to achieve greater um, progress at the border. And finally, and fin we have to put an end to farm firearms-related violence. Where it starts, and that's why our Building Safer Communities Fund is such an important opportunity to work with local community organizations, to tap into their experience, to tap into their wisdom, to identify where the risks are, to identify where those who are most exposed and can be exploited by organized crime and other elements who would put a gun in front of them to make the right choices instead. And we are accelerating the rollout of that fund as we have been doing over the last number of months, which I think will help to round out a strategy that has to be comprehensive. And once again, I do want to thank all of the members of this committee for their thoughtfulness and for their work. Uh, I look forward to reading this bill, to studying this bill, and hopefully to passing this bill as quickly as possible so that we can stop gun violence once and for all. Thank you. Merci. Minister, I know that you've um, gone across the country, as have I, and met with police forces. Uh, what I'm hearing is that they are stretched quite thin. Are you hearing the same thing? Um, thank you, Ms. Dancho. Uh, there's no doubt that we need to support law enforcement, domestic law enforcement, and one of the reasons that's one of the reasons why. So, sorry, we Minister, have, what uh, I'm asking created is, have you also heard that police sorry, forces? Sorry, if I could just, if, if I could what just. What I'm asking is, if you have heard that police forces are their resources are stretched quite thin, they're they're having challenges keeping up with the crime that we're seeing. That's what I have heard. Do you agree? I was trying to uh, complete my answer, Ms. Dancho, yes and, no. and I think I'm being responsive to your question, which is that I acknowledge that we need to support domestic law enforcement, which is what we are doing through our anti-guns and gangs uh, fund. Those resources are being transferred to provincial and territorial partners, which in turn filters through to domestic police, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you, Minister. So I would, I would take that as a tacit yes. You would agree that police resources uh, are stretched thin and they require more resources. Um, we're also seeing violent crime has increased over the past seven years by 32 percent. Are you familiar with that statistic? I'm alarmed by it, which is why we can't accept mm. the status quo. The Violent Crime Severity Index is also up 18 points, and there were more than 124,000 additional violent crimes last year than in 2015. Are you familiar with that as well? I am, which is why we presented Bill C-21. The vast majority of gun crime is caused by gangs and criminals using illegally obtained firearms. Do you agree? which is why we've got new tools in Bill C-21 to combat organized crime. According to Toronto Police, guns smuggled in from the United States represent upwards of 9 out of 10 handguns used in crime. Do you agree? Which is why we invested $321 million since last year and seized a record number of guns last year at the border. During the 2019 federal campaign, the Liberal platform stated that your confiscation regime of firearms would cost between $400 and $600 million. Recent estimates put it upwards of $5 billion. Uh, that's considerably more money than you're investing in additional border protection. Is that correct? Well, I would begin by saying that assault-style rifles have no place in our communities, which is why we want to implement a buyback program to get them out once and for all. Are you? Will you be spending, according to your federal campaign, four hundred to six hundred million? Estimates say it may be upward of five billion. That's considerably more than you've invested in recent years in the border. It's also considerably more than your communities fund. Correct. Well, I would say two things in response to that question, Ms. Dancho. First, we plan to be very transparent about the costing around the buyback program, but I also want to be clear with you 
and all members of this committee that there is no way to put a price on a life lost. And all you have to do mm -hmm. is look into the eyes of any of the families who've lost somebody to an assault style rifle. I think it is very concerning that we're seeing a rise of gun violence in our cities. And as I've outlined, and, and you seem to have agreed that the the problem certainly is gun smuggling, but you're investing considerably less money in border enforcement and considerably less money in community protection, although you've acknowledged that that is the primary source of gun violence in our country. I do want to switch gears a little bit and talk about firearms owners. I am a firearm owner. Uh, we undergo rigorous licensing processes. We're trained, tested, and vetted. Would you agree? We do, and I respect law-abiding gun owners. I've visited with their communities. I know that they place safety as a premium value. There is the, you may be familiar with the Liberal Long Gun Registry from the 90s. It was estimated to cost about $2 million annually to administer. I'm sure you're familiar with this. It ended up costing $1.2 billion. So the estimates from your government that you may be spending 400 to $600 million now, estimates are saying perhaps upwards of $500 billion, or $5 billion, pardon me. It's you didn't mean $500 billion. $5 right? billion. Okay. Uh, well, you never know. Based on your Liberal track <laughs> record, there is considerable uh, questions to be had about how much you're going to be spending on the confiscation regime. So, Minister, I'm quite concerned of recent news that, ha that your government will be redirecting police resources, which we've outlined today in our conversation, are stretched quite thin dealing with a 32% increase in violent crime since your government's been office. Uh, you're planning to redirect RCMP resources and possibly other police resources to your confiscation regime. Can you comment on that? Well, I think that it's based on some false assumptions, which so is So you that, won't be redirecting RCMP resources? Well, again, if I could just be permitted to answer your question, which is a thoughtful one. Um, ensuring that police services who operate within provincial boundaries have the resources necessary to enforce laws to keep our communities safe is not mutually exclusive to buying back assault-style rifles. And the reason is simple. Those guns were designed with one purpose in mind, and that is to kill. And so we believe that by taking them out of our communities you with the buyback that program, with fair Minister, compensation, if I may just conclude, that we will be I would, our I would urge safer. you to reconsider redirecting police resources to your confiscation regime. I think it is reckless and will further endanger our communities, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Being here today. We uh, Minister, you. I wanted to begin by thanking you for uh, bringing this uh, bill forward. Obviously, you know, our, our job as a committee is to take a good piece of legislation and make it better. And so what I'd uh, love to be able to do today is just dig into you with you on a, on a couple of issues that I think uh, are, are worthy of consideration. You know, uh, the VPD, Vancouver Police Department, um, presented to us during the course of our uh, Guns and Gangs study, which I think was a very, very good piece of work done by this committee. And one of the things that we came to really learn uh, from them, and I've had the subsequent opportunity to kind of dig in with them on, is, uh, and other police forces, is the, factor of, uh, the fact of ghost guns. The fact that people can manufacture weapons at home using components that they can either buy online or that they can buy at local stores or worse yet that they can um, 3D print to make, uh, to make their own weapons. So, you know, I'd love to know if you're willing to or if you're opening, opening you are open rather, to strengthening the legislation uh, in front of us um, to think about ghost, ghost guns and how we can really prevent uh, this from becoming an even larger problem than it is, thinking, the, realizing that we may be dealing with a problem today that looks a certain way, but this is in reality, in my view, the problem that we're going to be facing one, two, three, five years from now. And can we start to think about that uh, more meaningfully? Mr. Nur Mohammed, uh, uh, through the chair to you, uh, I would say that your question is a very important one, and that is dealing with um, the advent of ghost guns, which is based on a uh, new and cheap uh, plastic technology. Uh, I will tell you that in visiting your community and having met with uh, both the mayor there as well as the chief of police, Chief Palmer, that they have both identified um, the proliferation of ghost guns uh, as, a, as an important priority for us to deal with. I should tell you as well that I've had the chance to meet with uh, our American counterparts including at the, uh, one of the headquarters of the FBI at Quantico, where I have seen this technology firsthand on display. And it is imperative that you study this issue. Um, I believe that it is one of the things that we are going to need to tackle, not only potentially legislatively, but with additional resources. And that's why the investments that we have put at the border, including the $321 million dollars since last year alone, is equipping the CBSA, the RCMP, other law enforcement partners with the technology that they need 
to intercept and detect this new type of ghost gun so that we can stop them before that we get into our community. So I think the short answer to your question is, of course, I'm always um, very open to receiving any recommendations that you or others may have from this committee with regards to strengthening the bill. Thank you. And then you just digging in a little bit further, again, talking about uh, component parts, you know, one of the other elements that I think we, uh, we will hopefully be digging into a little bit is how do we make sure that we think about regulating purchase of component parts? And I think, frankly, licensing for purchasing of specific component parts and, and ammunition. Is this something that, uh, again, you'd be willing to consider in the deliberations? I know that Splitting up the different components of a, of a gun is one of the ways in which organized crime attempts to subvert detection at the border uh, or at other uh, places uh, within our communities, and that uh, it is one of the more, I think, um, technical aspects uh, of the bill that, uh, that you may wish to study and, again, put forward in the form of a recommendation. Uh, I would say that our overarching objective uh, remains uh, to stop gun violence, and that means taking a look at the, the you know the various ways in, in, and innovative technologies that uh, that are manifesting, including through ghost guns, including through um, you know the different components that, that that can be assembled to then meet the definition of a prohibited or a restricted or an unrestricted firearm, so that we can keep our community safe. Thank you, Minister. Um, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about airsoft airsoft guns. You know, there are those that are opposed to this legislation that are using airsoft guns as an example of perhaps a lack of understanding of, of the sport and indeed of, of guns. And I think there are those that would try to convince people that government thinks that airsoft guns kill people. And I would submit that they don't, but that they can get people killed because in difficult situations, if somebody has an airsoft gun that looks almost exactly like uh, a particularly dangerous weapon, uh, law enforcement may response, respond as though that is a, uh, a weapon carrying a live round. So I guess what I'm struggling with is we have obviously those that are at, you know, ardent supporters of the air, airsoft as a sport, but also don't want to be in positions where those weapons can get people killed. Do you see a way to address this without causing harm to airsoft industry and those that participate in it, but also in a way that makes sure law enforcement are not put in the unenviable situation of having to make a split-second decision when they see something that looks like it could be an assault rifle when it's actually an airsoft gun? Well, first, I just want to indicate that I look forward to the committee's work on uh, the issue of, of how we uh, tackle what I think has been identified as a challenge by law enforcement around um, the industry's uh, ability to make airsoft guns uh, look increasingly exactly uh, like a real gun. And there are others at this table, including uh, former chief, now Deputy Commissioner Larkin, uh, who could probably give uh, some additional testimony to that effect. But the, the object is really to be sure, um, you know, not that, you know, people can't participate uh, safely uh, in, in an industry, but rather to be sure that when law enforcement responds to a gun call, uh, that, that, that there are, that, that we're sure that, uh, that there is uh, no loss of life as a result of a gun which may look exactly like a, a real gun. And indeed, this is something that has occurred where we have seen a loss of life, including in my hometown in Scarborough not too long ago, where police uh, showed up and uh, a replica gun was mistaken for a real one and sadly somebody lost their life. So that is the intent uh, behind these provisions and I know that the committee will be studying them very closely. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Chair. Welcome, Minister. Thank you for coming here. I have several questions for you. You know that there's a huge problem in Canadians' major cities, uh, Montreal, Quebec City, others. We often talk about uh, this issue during QP. C21 will help deal us with the trafficking of uh, with the trafficking of uh, firearms and smuggling. But you're basing this on one m measure. That is, you're going to increase the maximum fine to 14 years for this type of crime. But I don't know that in concrete terms at the border this will make a difference. We know that there are many illegal firearms that come through our border. Don't you think that we need to take a more concrete measure in C21 to deal with this specific problem? Uh, 
First of all, Ms. Michaud, I'd like to thank you for the leadership that you have shown on this issue. We both share the same concerns about this issue. There are There's too much loss of life. It, it's enough. I totally agree with you on that. As for your question what about what we're doing at the border, I think that there are a few different uh, elements or aspects to our strategy. First of all, resources. We have to continue uh, hiring people because they work on the first line uh, at, at the CBSA. And the proof of this is that last year we had see, we seized a record number of firearms. That's progress, but we have to go even further. Secondly, the second aspect is that we have to work in close cooperation, not only with Quebec, but with the United States. I have discussed this issue with the Secretary Americus to enhance the level of cooperation, information sharing, and intelligence. That's important. So I do understand that we are intercepting more and more firearms. Look what happened in Dranville in 2021. I believe there were 2,008 uh, firearms uh, that were transported. He received a five years prison sentence, and now he's on, uh, 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 he's been released. So do you think that this specific measure will really uh, prevent the smuggler from going ahead and doing this? Because it's, it's, uh, we're, going, we're not going to use hardened criminals to smuggle. We're going to take somebody who doesn't have a criminal record uh, and maybe someone who, uh, who has only committed a few minor crimes and, uh, and we choose these people to do the smuggling. Do you think that this measure is really going to discourage someone from smuggling illegal firearms across the uh, border? We, there are some good measures in this bill. You have decided to... Uh, you have uh, giving you are giving more authority to the Department of Immigration and the Nuclear Association. But what about assault weapons? You have taken some measures there. You have in May 2020 you dealt with assault weapons, but then other types of weapons have come on the, to the mar market, and that weren't on this list. So why not use C21 to? really deal with this particular issue. You packed a lot in your question, but with respect to the assault, assault weapons, that's why we, we, that's exactly why we are dedicated to, uh, to in implementing a buyback program to get this type of firearm uh, away from our communities. Secondly, I do agree with you in the context of, uh, with respect to the tools uh, available under C-21, even the stricter sentences in isolation, nothing, th that in itself won't do anything. We have to implement a full range of tools at the same time to send a cl very clear message, a strong message to all organized criminal, uh, organized crime uh, criminals. And C-21 will do this. We have more severe sentences. We have surveillance tools. Other th authorities will get involved, not only in my department, but other police departments as well. So put a halt to these people who want to terrorize our community. If I may, one final question. You want us to adopt this bill very quickly. And in 2019, just before I was elected, you adopted uh, through order and decree um, uh, some, some rent measures, such as in the one d done in May 2021. And in this bill, are there any elements that will be implemented through regulation? The requirement for licenses for importing ammunition, 
Do you think that you're going to go ahead a little bit more quickly with the uh, with the orders? Pardon me. Uh, you have, Minister, you have to answer in, in a few seconds. The answer is yes, and I can give you examples after the meeting. Um, I also want to continue on the subject of uh, airsoft that Mr. Noom Mohammed brought, brought up. Um, I had a great summer of consulting with constituents, and I got to visit the uh, Victoria Fish and Game Protective Association. They have a, a large airsoft course. Um, I got to uh, be, play the part of a referee during a match. And the people who are involved in the sport really love what they do. It's a growing sport. Um, all sorts of demographics um, take part in it. They are quite concerned with how C21 is currently written. And I know that your department has really received a lot of correspondence. When you introduced this version of C21, your department was kind enough to provide a backgrounder to members of parliament. And you know, your backgrounder stated that current owners will be allowed to keep and use the ones that they already own. They cannot transfer it to another person. Uh, manufacturers will be, will be able to sell them, but they have to adjust the designs. And that your government will consult with industry and law enforcement on how to implement the law. I'm curious um, because, you know, the background is stating that current owners will be allowed to keep the ones that they already own. But how is that possible with the current wording of the bill? Because according to the Library of Parliament's read of the bill, it's going to effectively make them prohibited devices. So. There's a bit of a disconnect here, and just as a quick follow-up, are, are you open to, like, what kind of consultations have you had with the industry? What are some ways that we can find our way through this impasse? Um, well, first, thank you very much uh, for your advocacy on this issue, and I appreciate that uh, you've been speaking with um, the industry and with um, responsible um, airsoft owners and other gun owners, so I, we do appreciate the feedback. Um, secondly, we are at the same time consulting ourselves with a number of different industry leaders and lobbyists. And, you know, I just want to stress uh, for the record that um, we look forward to working collaboratively uh, w with them and, you know, in the spirit of making sure that legislative intent is aligned with language. Of course, if, if there is ambiguity there, then let's try to clear that up. I mean, that's one of the, I think, important functions of this committee is to be sure that the government gets the benefit of some input on on how we can have a bill that, that reflects what we are trying to accomplish, including as it relates to Airsoft. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, I know my constituents are listening to this, so the very fact that you said you're open to collaboration on this, that's good, and I, I will commit to working with you to find a, a, a way forward that is satisfactory to everyone. Secondly, uh, again, involving the Victoria Fish and Game Protective Association, I, I have to give them a plug. They also invited me on a separate day to witness a competition. Uh, it was the International Practi Practice Shooting uh, Confederation, IPSC. Um, so they were concerned that the bill um, makes reference. I think it's uh, Clause 43. It creates a new Section 97.1 in that uh, the only discipline that is mentioned is the Olympic Committee or the International Paralympic Committee, which is a very, very small subsection of people. I mean, these are elite shooters. I'm wondering, uh, what has the correspondence been like from representatives of IPSC, and is your department open to broadening the language? Because, again, these are people, my constituents, who are very passionate about what they're doing. Um, I witnessed a competition. It's very safe. The rules are pretty, pretty well enforced. Just want to hear your comments on that, Minister. Um, well, first, I, I think you know where we're coming from uh, in the introduction of the National Handgun Freeze and its rationale. And at the same time, we have proposed a number of uh, reasonable exemptions, including for those who participate uh, in sport shooting, who represent Canada at an elite level. Mm -hmm. uh, I am sure that from within the various communities across the country that there are, um, you know, different standards in mind about what the threshold should be. And this is part of the con ongoing consultation that we are embarked upon. So, you know, my response to you would be, um, you know, through you, or through you, if your constituency uh, has concerns or would like to propose, you know, other other areas of uh, as to how we can refine what that standard is, I think uh, it is incumbent on us to be open-minded about that. But at, while at the same time recognizing that uh, what we are trying to do is to reverse the alarming trend around handgun violence, which, as I said in my introductory remarks, yeah. has become the number one type of gun used in homicides. Yep. No, un understood. Um, and then I think I've got room for, for one final question. Uh, you received a letter on May the 16th.
15th of this year. Um, it was from an, a, a number of, of women's groups who were quite concerned with the red flag laws, the so-called red flag law provisions in this legislation. Uh, they are very concerned about the downloading of responsibility, especially when you know, the onus may be on an individual who is fleeing domestic violence to go and face the court system by themselves. I know there have been improvements in this version to try and protect anonymity, but can you, Minister, you must be re uh, familiar with this May 16th letter. Do you have anything to say to this committee in response to the concerns that they raised? Well, first that we will continue to work with them and uh, all of the partners who've come forward to uh, offer constructive ways in which we can uh, tackle gender-based violence, intimate partner violence, domestic abuse in connection with guns, which is uh, a phenomenon that has become more and more serious, particularly over the last uh, number of years. And, and what we had said in response, I believe one of the last times that I appeared before this committee, is that we would be receptive to finding ways to ensure that those protocols were present, uh, but not as uh, an exclusive alternative to uh, using or leveraging existing authorities, but rather to be used in conjunction. And we did, I think, two things that were directly responsive to the concerns that were laid out in that letter and elsewhere. Uh, one, we built in um, protections uh, for complainants who wish to come forward to reduce the potential for retaliation mm -hmm. uh, for those who are uh, wanting to see red flag laws. Excuse me, uh, D seconds, see what you uh, red flag laws introduced. But secondly, um, in my uh, renewed mandate letter to the Commissioner of the RCMP, um, we uh, set out as a priority um, the need to be sure that uh, local law enforcement have the diverted resources necessary to respond to uh, gun calls where there is concern around intimate partner violence and gender partner, uh, gender based violence. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You, Minister, you're about to embark on a program that could reach into the billions of dollars. Have you or your department commissioned any studies that demonstrates that this buyback plan is an effective use of taxpayer dollars to enhance public safety? I've spoken with the victims. Uh, but have of you commissioned a study that victims. proves this? Of course, we're studying the costing very carefully. You're studying it currently. You don't have a study. You don't have proof right now that it will. Um, Mr. Lloyd, let, let, let me unpack the answer for you for just a moment, if I can. Well, I don't need to because you said you don't have a study. You're currently studying it. Minister, I have an engagement paper that was sent out by your department in October of 2018 that directly states under the heading International Experience that, quote, in all cases, the data does not conclusively demonstrate that these handgun or assault weapon bans have led to any reduction in gun violence, end quote. Your own ministry recognizes that there isn't data to support your buyback argument. Why are you wasting billions of dollars on a scheme that hasn't worked? Before I begin, I wonder if I could be permitted to actually complete an answer. If you're not interested and you would just like to read ahead, from your sheet, you can do that. But I'd like to be able to Go finish. Ahead. Is that okay? We took the decision to ban assault-style rifles because they were designed to kill. Um, we looked at uh, some very uh, careful standards around the definition, uh, which is contained in the order in Council. And we are now setting about the launch of a buyback program so that we can get these guns out of our community because we owe it to the victims to make sure there isn't another tragedy or a mass casualty. The fact is you don't have any studies that demonstrates that this is going to enhance public safety. Minister, since you believe that a gun buyback for law-abiding firearms owners will enhance public safety, as you just said, why are you also not launching a gun buyback for illegal firearms possessed by criminals? Well, in the first instance, uh, we've put in place a national handgun freeze and a ban on importing additional uh, handguns into the country, which is a measure you oppose. We've I'm talking also, about buybacks, though, Minister. Well, if I could just be permitted to finish, Mr. Lloyd. Um, you also oppose our national ban on assault-style rifles, and you would propose to make them uh, legal again, which we think You're is fundamentally wrong. You're not answering the wrong. question, Minister. You're dancing around the question. Why don't you have a program to buy back illegal firearms from criminals on the street? Why aren't you putting a program like that in place? Well, we've taken a very concrete and tangible step forward to addressing handgun violence through the introduction of a national handgun freeze. And we're also going to get assault-style rifles out of our communities in collaboration with our Minister, partners. wouldn't you agree that it'd be more beneficial for public safety to get an, buy back an illegal firearm off the street rather than buying back a firearm from a sports shooter in Barrie, Ontario? Well, the first thing I would say, Mr. Lloyd, and I've said this before, is that I respect law-abiding gun owners. 
But then why I've, do you have a program that only targets them? Why don't you have a program to get illegal guns off the street by buying it back from criminals? Well, you and I disagree about that, but I do respect... You don't think that orders. a buyback program for criminals would be effective? We've taken the judgment that when it comes to assault-style rifles, that they have no place in our communities. And we've also taken the largest step forward, probably in a generation with C21, by putting in place a national handgun freeze so that we can reverse the trend and the growth of a universe of hand of a type of gun by about 45 to 55,000 new registrations Thank you, Minister. Minister, my next question year. is, you're seeking to cap magazine size to no more than five rounds. Is that correct, yes or no? Yes. Will this apply to all long guns or only semi-automatics? Well, what we have proposed is... Uh, Certainly with regards to... Um, will it apply know. to all long guns? No. Okay, so will it... You, do you understand the Lee Enfield rifle is a commonly used hunting rifle? It has 10 rounds in the magazine. You're aware of that? I have heard that. Is the Lee Enfield rifle, because it has 10 rounds in its magazine, on the list of things that will be regulated? Let me take, let me take a step back and tell you why it is that we've put um, these standards into uh, the bill. We think that by doing so, that we will reduce gun violence. See, the important thing, Minister, is that these firearms are predominantly used by Indigenous people to fulfill their traditional treaty hunting rights. And if you are limiting their ability to use a Lee Enfield because of C-21, you're limiting Indigenous rights. This violates Section 35 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. How is this not colonialism, Minister? Well, we're consulting with Indigenous communities, uh, and we have and will continue to consult on Bill C-21. Good. And we're listening very carefully uh, to Indigenous leaders to make sure that uh, for those who hunt as part of their tradition or who hunt uh, to eat, uh, that, that, that this bill will be consistent with the prin those principles of reconciliation. And I assure you, those conversations are ongoing. Appearance. Minister, in your opening statement, and I was very happy to hear you say this, you talked about the fact that C-21 is part of a multidimensional plan that includes investments to ensure that uh, youths have activities that will prevent them from joining street games and, and historic investments totaling $321 million to strengthen our borders. And this final point makes me very proud and happy in my community in vaudreuil solange as you know, our community is the training center for CBSA uh, officers. Mr. Minister, could you talk to us about the Im importance of these investments to prevent uh, illegal firearms from entering Canada? Thank you for your question, Mr. Shifke. First of all, I'd like to point out the good work done by the CBSA at our borders. They have made a lot of progress in fighting against uh, farm-related, uh, firearm-related violence. Last year, it seized a record number of illegal firearms. And, but despite this progress, we have to go even further. And that's why we will continue investing by adding resources at the border to give increased resources to the RCMP. And I would like to acknowledge that there are institutions in your writing. I had the opportunity last spring to visit the school where new SBSA officers are being trained. It was very inspiring. We have to continue supporting their efforts in this fight against uh, firearm-related violence. That response and also for the visit, I'm sure it was greatly appreciated by all of the uh, new formed agents that will be uh, protecting our borders all across the country. Minister, C-21 is going to go a long way in protecting communities like mine and Vaudreuil Soulange uh, and communities like Vaudreuil Soulange all across the country. And I'm looking forward to diving in with committee members to try and strengthen the bill. Uh, and one of the questions that I had and, and members of my community had was with regards to uh, ghost guns. And this was brought up by my colleague, Mr. Noor Mohammed. Um, we had uh, an incident in Montreal 
Montreal just two months ago where a young man had purchased uh, parts uh, online and, and had put together uh, a firearm that was used uh, in violent crime in Montreal. And I've received numerous um, emails and calls from my constituents uh, wondering if there's any way that we can combat this. And I'm wondering, Minister, you had mentioned earlier that you spoke with uh, your colleagues in the United States, and I'm sure you've had discussions with other uh, counterparts around the world. Have you heard from them any effective ways that they've been able to counter this? And can you share those with the committee so you can help guide our, our work in the coming weeks? Um, well, first, thank you, Mr. Shifke, for uh, the question. And uh, it is um, not lost on me that the last number of months have been extremely difficult for Montreal. Going back to last spring, I had the chance to participate in a forum to counter uh, gun violence at the invitation of Mayor Plant. And uh, in attending that, um, that, that, that particular um, forum, I was very struck by uh, the young people who spoke about uh, the, the friends that they'd lost. And uh, sadly, since then, we have seen um, ongoing shootings uh, pretty much consistently and unabated. And I have stayed in very close contact with both Mayor uh, Plant as well as uh, my counterpart, uh, Minister uh, Guibault, uh, to, to try to turn the tide around, which is why in the summer, as you may recall, uh, I went to announce uh, funds uh, for directly for Quebec uh, under the Building Safer Communities uh, Fund in the amount of roughly $40 million, of which I want to say I believe $17 or $18 million was to go to Montreal. These funds are specifically designed to stop gun crime before it occurs by looking at root causes, by working with local organizations, by um, enhancing their capacity to offer programs and services so that people who are at risk, especially young people, uh, make the right choices. So we think this is a, a, a critical uh, pillar in our overall strategy to reduce gun violence, and we think that the funds that we've allocated to Quebec and to Montreal will go some way towards achieving that goal. A question was raised about a question I, too, would like to raise with you. On May 16th, several women's groups approached you to say that they were worried about the red flag laws in this bill. They felt that it was very problematic, if not counterproductive, uh, in that the victims had to make the request to um, r r get this order. But I have seen that we, that we are trying to preserve the uh, anonymity of the victim, but considering, considering the family situations of these people, uh, perhaps the police don't have the, all the tools at their disposal to protect this. this I believe this was, bill was tabled uh, May 30th, but, and you didn't have time to change anything at that time. But the position taken by the women's group has not changed. Uh, they, rather than using the means that are already available, that they felt that more authority should be given to the communities, uh, such as in the education field. Do you, would you be prepared to amend the bill, given the fears expressed by these individuals? Uh, Thank you for your question. The new protocol uh, proposed in C21 and the red flag and yellow flag loss, well, the purpose of these measures is to uh, reverse the trend uh, with respect to um, firearms and intimate partner Violence. That's the goal. But I do understand that there are concerns that have been expressed by various women's organizations, survivors groups. That's why we amended the bill. And in my opinion, I feel that we strengthened the proposal. The other thing to consider is that this is only one option. It's not mandatory. It's another protective measure for those who wish to use it. However, I do acknowledge that we have to give 
resources to the police departments so that they can uh, use the authorities that they currently have. Do I have time for another question? Three seconds. No, I guess that's um, not enough. Minister, uh, our first major report at this committee uh, was addressing gun and gang violence, and I thought it was a study that we all worked together quite well on. Mm -hmm. And um, I've always approached the issue of gun violence as acknowledging that, you know, a single piece of legislation by itself is not going to address the problem. It has to be taken in the context with policy, effective funding of law enforcement, working with international partners, et cetera. And I, I think you would agree with me. I think all colleagues would agree with me on that. On the question of domestic diversion, because I know that's a, a big rationale behind C21, we did hear testimony at our committee on the dangers um, of, of people owning large numbers of handguns and themselves setting themselves up as targets for criminal organizations. Far easier to steal a handgun that's already present in Canada rather than going to the trouble of trying to smuggle it across an international border. Now, we did make a recommendation in that report uh, to, you know, ask for additional research into the prevalence of domestic diversion. Uh, since that report was issued, uh, do you have any further updates from your department on the, how widespread the problem is, um, any solutions apart from what's in C21 that your government is considering for people who may be targets of criminal organizations? Uh, ju just that I think it's imperative that we continue to um, gather the best available data on the ratio of illegal importation to domestic trafficking. And I know that that is something that um, the RCMP is going to be equipped to do with greater uh, capacity as, as, as the CBSA, um, specifically around tracing, uh, because we've made investments to, uh, to increase their ability to find the source of guns. And by doing that, by giving the RCMP those additional tools, we think we'll have a, um, an even clearer picture than we do right now about how many guns are coming in illegally as opposed to those that are being uh, transferred and trafficked illegally within the country. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Jeff. See you. Uh, throughout your dialogue today, Minister, you have mentioned uh, a couple times about the great work this committee does. And Mr. McGregor just touched on our last, uh, one of our good, uh, good reports we did, which was a path forward, reducing gun and gang violence in Canada. Minister, have you read that report? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. Thank you. Um, so have I, as we all spend a lot of time on that <laughs> You've report. done your homework? I hope so. But in that report, we had 34 recommendations, and there was no recommendation for a nationwide handgun ban. Where is your data to support this handgun ban? We did a lot of work on that. We didn't come up with that. Can you tell me where your uh, rationale and data is? Well, first, I, I, I do thank the committee for its work, and I know that there are uh, a diversity of opinions and views uh, on an issue as important as firearms. Uh, the reason that we introduced a national handgun freeze is because of the alarming trends around um, the increase of handgun violence, and specifically that handguns are now the number one type of gun used in homicides. And in my opinion, Mr. Shipley, I don't know whether or not you agree with it, but that is not arbitrary, that, that there is a connection between the explosion of the handgun universe, which is increasing approximately 45 to 55,000 new registrations a year for the last decade, and the fact that handguns are now the number one type of gun used in homicides. So our national handgun freeze is an effort to reverse that trend. And thank you. And we're all here to try and stop violence that's happening across Canada and all of our, our cities, especially. What we heard, though, it was through city after city, police chief after police chief, we heard that it was illegal handguns coming across the borders. It wasn't legal handgun owners. So if you don't have the data on that, I have had some people approach me on this issue who have told me maybe cynically they thought this was more of a political situation and decision. Is the data perhaps from some polling questions you've done across Canada for this decision? Um, Mr. Shipley, I, I can assure you there's uh, nothing uh, political about um, the approach that we've taken in this bill uh, in as much as we've put forward what we think are the best uh, and most practical solutions to stop the alarming trends around the increase of gun violence. We've looked at the data, and the data says 
unequivocally that gun crime is going up, that handgun crime is going up. And my response to you is that the status quo is not working. And the most important thing that I can convey to you, uh, Mr. Shipley, is that um, I, I respect the work that you are doing. I, I know that, you know, you, you bring different views points to, thank from you your that. community, thank but, you that, but like, let's try to solve of, the problem thank together. Thank you. I think we both agree there's an issue. We're just perhaps disagreeing as to where the uh, situation lies when you talked about root cause earlier. I do have to ask, and I quoted, I wrote this down as you were speaking at the beginning, and you said a very interesting phrase, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to quote you. You said, this bill will stop gun violence once and for all. Do you really believe that? I certainly, uh, th that is the goal. And it's, but, it, but I want to be clear that Bill C-21 by itself won't accomplish that. We also have to invest in law enforcement. We also have to make sure that we stop illegal trafficking. And we also have to put into place preventative strategies, including the Building Safer Communities Fund. And if we do those three things together, then I think we can uh, finally reverse the trend on gun violence and put an end to it. I'll give my remaining time over to my colleague. Uh, Mr. Minister, thank you for being here. In your opening remarks, you talked about the gun confiscation program. You're calling it a gun buyback program. Uh, but even before it's gotten off the ground, it's already facing headwinds with the provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan now saying that they will opt out of it. Uh, given our constitutional structure, uh, federal jurisdiction and provincial jurisdiction, clearly for this program to be successful, you need to work with provinces and get their cooperation. Do you have a plan B in place if Alberta and Saskatchewan are not coming on side? Well, I'm focused on plan A, and I, I want to assure you that, that we do collaborate with our provincial and territorial partners, in, including Alberta. I mean, I just issued a joint statement with uh, my counterpart there to bring back the Sixka Police Service, which is a public safety priority. It's a priority that uh, will help advance reconciliation. So there are um, very uh, important priorities on which we are collaborating on. And I would come back to uh, Ms. Danchel's question at the outset, which I think is an important one, and that is that in the view of this government, that um, advancing a fair buyback program that will compensate uh, law-abiding gun owners uh, for the assault-style rifles that they uh, originally purchased lawfully is consistent with keeping our community safe. And we will always be collaborative with our provincial and territorial partners. My door will always be open to working with them uh, in a wide variety of priorities to achieve that goal. Thank Minister, you. thank you for uh, joining us today and all the witnesses, thank you for being here today. As a as a former police officer, I'm aware of many challenges law enforcement faces in addressing firearm trafficking and firearm smuggling. Minister, could you please uh, tell this committee how Bill C-21 will support and provide additional tools to law enforcement? Uh, well, thank you for the question, Mr. Chang. I, the, the two examples that uh, I think highlight our response to organized crime are contained in Bill C-21 in reference to the more severe uh, criminal sentences in maximum sentences for those who traffic illegally guns, uh, going from 10 years to 14 years. Um, you know, you're a former police officer. I'm a former uh, Crown. I still uh, read the criminal code. Uh, you know, last time I checked, the 14-year maximum sentence is the last stop before you get to life sentence. So that is a very strong and unambiguous signal to illegal gun traffickers that if you're in the business of trying to get guns, illegal guns into communities, that, that you face the prospect of, um, of, of, of serving significant time. And secondly, um, we propose to offer new uh, surveillance uh, and wiretap powers uh, to police that, that we're... Um, firearms offenses under the criminal code become eligible for that particular investigative technique. It's one that will, I believe, help to disrupt um, illegal supply chains around firearms, uh, both internationally and uh, within, our, within our, our borders. So those are two concrete examples which I think C-21, when it becomes law, will help us tackle organized crime and illegal trafficking of guns. Thank you, uh, Minister. In regards to the fire, uh, authorizing wiretapping for uh, the firearm offenses, 
Can you discuss how these new measures will help support enforcement agency and to make our community safer with the wiretapping? Well, I think the simplest way to explain it is that um, a Part 6 under the Criminal Code uh, designates a certain number of offenses for which police can apply for a wiretap. And um, this bill proposes to expand that list to include uh, some additional firearms offenses, which uh, will give them uh, greater capacity uh, to hopefully disrupt the efforts of organized crime when it comes to you know trafficking uh, or illegally possessing guns. And it's an important tool. It's not a tool of first resort. I mean, there are a number of steps that, um, that, that law enforcement has to demonstrate to a judge before a wiretap is, uh, is uh, authorized, including investigative necessity. Um, but, but I think that this is another concrete way in which we can tackle organized crime. We often hear about the challenges of illegal guns uh, at our borders or being trafficked in our communities. This is a very uh, concrete additional uh, measure that we can offer law enforcement to help uh, reverse those trends and to bring those who are responsible for terrorizing our communities to justice. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. But can you discuss also some of the challenges that Canada faces related to increased number of handguns in the country year over year. And can you tell this committee why it is so important that we set a cap on uh, the number of handguns in this country to protect Canadians? Uh, Mr. Chang, um, you know, somebody who lives in a city that's uh, beset by handgun violence is somebody who works with um, colleagues from across the country who, you know, have um, seen far too many lives lost. Uh, including law enforcement, I was just uh, at a funeral for a number of off, uh, for an officer uh, who lost uh, their life uh, in uh, in the Toronto Police Service. Um, the challenges are significant; they're really complex, and uh, I'm in no way trying to uh, gloss over or simplify um, the complexity of that problem. But in C21, the government has made a best effort to try and put forward for this committee and Parliament's consideration a comprehensive legislative strategy that aims to reverse the trend around handgun violence and around organized crime and around domestic violence and the presence of guns. And it is part of a much broader strategy that also looks to give additional resources to law enforcement to stop illegal trafficking at the border and to prevent gun crime from occurring uh, in the first place. And if we do this work together, and if we remain focused, then I truly believe we can reverse the trends around the increases of gun violence and eradicate it once and for all. Thank you, Mr. Chang. And um, thank you, Minister, and, and of course, Deputy Minister. I understand you both have to leave at this point. Um, so that concludes this portion of the meeting. We will suspend for five minutes and uh, ask the remaining officials uh, to remain. Thank you. Uh, we're suspended. Uh, we heard the um, minister say that uh, there was going to be additional financial resources for uh, Canada Border Services uh, to st uh, stop the um, illegal, illegal importation of handguns. So my question would be to Mr. Gaspar then of the Canada Border Services. Uh, we, we heard from, we, we, we had just completed a study on guns and gangs and heard from a lot of witnesses, including from Canada Border Services. And one of the, uh, one of the issues that we heard from them was that there is a shortage of human resources, shortage of people to do the work. Uh, my riding is uh, Langley, it's uh, Langley Aldergrove, so there's a uh, land border crossing at Aldergrove. Uh, so I meet with a lot of uh, people who work for Canada Border Services. They confirm that, a shortage of human resources. So now when the minister was saying, well, we have additional, I think he said $321 million, where does that go? Is that going to help you? What do you really need to do your job effectively? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the member and to the committee. Uh, I think the, the minister made very clear that it is a range of solutions that ultimately are going to get us to where we want to go in terms of abating and addressing the scourge of gun violence. 
And those most recent investments the, mi the Minister uh, alluded to uh, in Budget 2021 are really intended to address the intelligence side uh, of our work. Um, so much of the CBSA's activity obviously is quite visible on the ground, the primary interactions with Canadians and Canadian businesses. Uh, but in addition to that, there's a lot of work that happens in the background, both with regards to uh, investigations, uh, intelligence, networking with our international partners, ensuring that we're uh, managing the border in a smart way in addition to being an effective way. So your point is well taken. There's certainly no doubt. We could always use more resources. I don't think you're ever going to have an official come before the committee and say we got enough. Um, but the reality is that to do a uh, smart and to manage a modern border, we need to do it intelligently, and that's really what the most recent set of investments were intended to do. Good, thank you. So we had witnesses that pointed out to us the obvious, that uh, Canada, the Canada-U.S. border is the longest undefended border in the world, 8,000 kilometers, and, uh, and our neighbor is the largest gun manufacturer, manufacturing culture in the world. So how do you possibly stop all the in inflow of illegal weapons? You know, uh, coming across lakes, coming across rivers, uh, coming across unauthorized border crossings. It's a good point. Again, as the minister indicated, there's a lot that has been done, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, I think the simple way to answer the question, and I'll, I'll expand from there, is that it really is about layering uh, our approaches and to not um, fool ourselves into thinking that perhaps there is a, uh, if I can borrow the expression, a magic bullet or a solution that can be pulled out of thin air. Um, so that's why the approach that's been taken both through the um, initiative to tackle guns and gangs violence from 2018 as well as the most recent investments were aimed at a multi-pronged approach. Investment in officers, investment in uh, technology such as ex advanced x-ray equipment, uh, as well as investments in new detector dog teams, enhancing our intelligence and investigatory capacity. Uh, and as the Minister underscored, you know, we have started to see some results. Last year we had the highest number of firearms seized uh, since we've started um, down this path. Of course, there's much more to do and um, it's certainly a matter of debate when you seize more. Is it because there's more coming or because you're getting better at it? I think it's a combination of both factors, but uh, certainly there is no single approach to be taken. It's about making sure that we're investing smartly, continuously in the broadest range of measures that can be taken. The guns are not being caught, that are being smuggled across. <clears throat> uh, evidence that we received from witnesses was that um, our data on the source of guns used in crime is very sparse. I was, we were, I think, surprised to hear that. Statistics Canada doesn't have any reporting system. Uh, police agencies across the country, it's not, they're not, probably a question for the for the uh, law enforcement people with us here today, that there's not a consistent requirement about reporting the use of guns, uh, guns used in crime. So we were surprised that the government came with a outright handgun ban when we don't have data that would support that that is going to keep Canadians any safer. Uh, so do you have any comments about that? Uh, we understand that 80% of handguns used in crime were smuggled in from the U.S. illegally by people who don't intend to ever register their guns. Through you, Mr. Chair, to the member, um, good afternoon, bonjour à tous, and um, I'll provide some national data around that. Uh, clearly, there is work happening with uniform crime reporting. Um, as we've heard, the crime severity index around the use of firearms in the commission of criminal offences is increasing. Uh, but one of the investment pieces where the RCMP is significantly focused on is firearms tracing. Um, and we've had a significant investment, a national approach, and we are working with all of our municipal agencies and provincial agencies across the country. Uh, uh, but, however, from our firearms tracing unit, when we look nationally, 69% of the firearms traced in Canada in 2021 were domestically sourced. So they were either diverted, lost, or stolen. Um, we had a witness that told us that. Mr. Van uh, then, 10 seconds. Seven seconds. I'm just going to exclude that that doesn't include Ontario data. Uh, so we're working right now very closely with one the province of, one, of Ontario. One of the problems, of course, is that we don't, don't even have a definition of what is the crime gun. And that's why we have these conflicting... Uh, pieces of evidence. Thank you, Mr. Van Poppen. Uh, did the witness wish to respond to that last? Or? So it's a point well taken, and uh, what I can assure you are we're working very closely with the FATE program in the province of Ontario, clearly uh, one of the provinces that has significant uh, increase in gun violence. Um, and so we're looking at mechanisms as to how do we share data uh, to provide that national support. But we have seen movement on that. We recognize it's an issue, and it's a good point for us to bring back and work on. And we would be pleased once again to provide written response as to the progress of that. 
my Thank question, you. first question is for the RCMP. We've had some conversations around red flag. Uh, the minister had answered some questions. I recall when we studied Bill C-71, uh, the Conservative Party opposed lifetime background checks. At the time, they were not supportive of, of uh, any kind of a reporting system for mental health issues. And yet we know that the, oh, I think it's 75, 80% of people who die by firearms are dying by suicide. And we know that women in particular are at risk when there's a firearm in the home. The, there's, there's data that strongly supports the risk to women when there's a firearm in the home. So, so one of the things we did in 71, we extended to lifetime background checks and, and we listened to witnesses like um, Dr. Alan Drummond and Alison Irons who talked about the need to strengthen red flags. So we do have something in the bill uh, which is better than what was in the previous version of C21 because people can remain anonymous. Um, but having said that, we also know that it's up to a judge to issue a prohibition order, and we don't control how a judge decides in a case. So if a woman does go to court um, and she can do it anonymously or through a woman's shelter, that red flag, um, the, the, they can appeal to the court, but we're, 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 we're relying on a judge to issue a prohibition order. So I was really heartened when I saw the, the mandate letter that was given to the RCMP that was also going to resource the chief, chief firearms officer to ensure that calls that are made are responded to promptly and also working with local police services. So in my area, it would be the Halton Police Service to ensure that if someone is reporting an issue with someone who has a firearm, whether it's for mental health or for gender-based violence, that it's responded to in a timely manner. Um, I'm just wondering if you could update us on how important that work is by the Chief Firearms Officer and how we are in terms of progressing on that. Thank you for that question. Um, we're actually progressing uh, quite well. So it's an end-to-end -end process, and I have to uh, stress that because it's not only the training, but it's the process of how they deal with these files. Um, so right now we're reviewing the training to ensure um, that it uh, has the correct information in there for um, both from a police uh, perspective, so that's the UCR coding, so that they understand that the timeliness of that is very important. And then that would go directly to a, a CFO um, as well, so that they know that when they identify, when it's identified to them, that they can action that as quickly as possible. Here or was that with local police services? So it's actually um, uh, the RCMP online systems. Okay. But we're also going to use that tool to educate as well. Okay. And then the other thing that was in the mandate letter was about this uniform crime reporting scoring, um, which sounds like a very complicated term, and I didn't actually know exactly what it was until I spoke to Alison Irons, whose daughter... Um, as, as many will know when she's testified, was killed by, stalked and killed by a law-abiding gun owner. Um, and one of the concerns that Allison has expressed was this uniform crime reporting, so that if there is an incident with someone who has a firearm, that it is reported by local police services. So that was also included in the commissioner's mandate letter. And I'm just wondering how you're doing on, on educating police services across the country on utilizing that tool. So this is actually part of that process. So when um, police of jurisdiction open a file, uh, the file has to be scored. And based on that scoring, it will um, automatically send uh, a flag to a chief firearms officer if a firearm is involved or if it, it's a, a file that we want to be aware of. So the timeliness of that scoring is very important. Um, so we are making some headway on that as well. Again, it's part of that training and education piece. Okay, thank you. I'm going to shift gears now to Airsoft. Um, last night I read a CBC article where... Um, the Regina Chief of Police, Evan Bray, said that replica weapons pose a problem because they're difficult to discern from real weapons. And he, he specifically referenced a frightening school lock 
crackdown that took place in Regina where a, a weapons charge was laid against a 13-year-old girl. In, in my community, just recently, there was a lockdown of White Oak Secondary School where there was a, uh, and, and a constituent sent me a video that one of the students took of the police coming into the portable uh, and it was, again, one of these airsoft rifles. So I, I'm just wondering, can you talk about how often, or if, if you have the data, how often um, incidents like this happen where, where a replica or airsoft gun is mistaken or used by someone and mistaken by the police um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a real gun? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I didn't say it very well. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, it's a very difficult piece of data to capture. Um, you know, from a policing perspective, uh, there's a delicate balance of recreational use and, and entertainment, uh, which law-abiding law -abiding citizens use. Uh, but one of our concerns from a policing perspective is putting uh, frontline police officers in a very difficult situation when they are responding to complaints, when they are responding to uh, crimes of commission and or uh, different types of events where an airsoft or replica, it's very difficult to actually recognize the difference, uh, recognize uh, that it may be a non-real uh, firearm, uh, you know, handgun or long gun. And so what we see is a series of interactions uh, around use of force, which do create and pose challenges for policing. Uh, and hence, we're trying to balance that and mitigate that through uh, different, uh, the Canadian Association Chiefs of Police, and in particular, Chief Evan Bray that you mentioned uh, from Regina is currently co-leading a Canadian Chiefs working group on firearms and a working group as to how do we modernize and progress firearms within our society. You will see fatal interactions across the country involving replica and or airsoft guns involving police intervention um, and of course we're currently working on a national uh, revamp or uh, you know new approach to intervention around policing because it is does pose a real life problem uh, and we're seeing it escalate uh, but it's very difficult we need to actually one of the recommendations and gaps recognized is how we track through uniform crime reporting so we actually have the data as a profession Thank you, mr chair I will continue along the same line. Mr. Larkin, you said it's difficult to get uh, data on airsoft guns, and it's difficult uh, to determine to what extent they pose a danger, but the government has decided to criminalize these replica guns. Have you provided the department or the minister with data uh, showing that uh, these uh, firearms have been used in various in the commission of various crimes. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your question. C21 proposes a very specific uh, uh, standard. Three six. I don't remember exactly. Uh, I, I I don't remember exactly how it said, but because the others are, are described in the legislation. So the intent of the bill is to fill this void. So yes, right now, the uh, Association of the police, uh, Chiefs of Police have, have asked the department to appreciate or to understand this gap in the legislation. To answer your question, yes. There have been some fears expressed and, and a request made um, uh, regarding this. In some cases, we've realized that uh, in some instances, the police officers think they're dealing with an, an air gun, but it's actually a real firearm. So. We, as was mentioned uh, a little earlier, there are more and more incidents where people have been killed. Why? Because they used an air gun and the police m misinterpreted this. We ask this question because we, we hear about all kinds of comments and fears uh, uh, with respect to gun control. And there are certain elements that are fluid or difficult to understand. In the document that your department provided us with, says that the manufacturers and retailers are going to be able to continue to sell these uh, uh, 
uh, guns, but th that makes me think of this uh, infamous measure in the U.S., whether if you have uh, an orange gun, uh, it may, is it possible to distinguish the difference between a real and a fake gun? Are we basing ourselves on this? Uh, if so, our manufacturers are going to change the way they produce the guns so they don't look exactly like these firearms, or they don't, as, as described in the law. Is that what I'm to understand? Thank you for your question. I must confess, I do get a lot of letters and requests, uh, 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 but we will begin consultations. There are some examples, international examples, We'll base our analysis on those um, figures. England has a very good system. Right now, I can't tell you what the final result will be, but we are discussing the matter with associations, and we're going to be discussing this matter with both the CBSA and the RCMP because this has an impact operationally. So we'll be making recommendations, and we have to strike a balance between and, and and we will we will understand the concerns expressed by the industry and we will look at what's being done in England England and other countries but we have a challenge often the industry can start produce uh, real firearms that look like replicas so that's I don't have a definitive answer because we're still gathering information but we are always discussing this matter with our colleagues. I'm happy to know that you're looking into this. Will this be, uh, will we have this information before we proceed with the clause by clause study? If I'm not mistaken, will be implemented or come into force as soon as you get uh, royal, thanks, royal assent. So we have no choice. I'm wondering whether you're, uh, you consider the, the fact that uh, more and more firearms are being made by a 3D process, uh, people are buying components on the internet. Is this something that you're starting to look at and that would lead to uh, amendments to Bill C-21 specifically? Thank you for your question. As a public servant, I can tell you what the government is going to decide to do. What I can say is that in your committee report, this has been raised, and this is something we've looked at very carefully. Any firearm that constitutes a danger to the, to the safety of the public is something we look at, and we analyze everything on an ongoing going basis, but I can't answer your question directly. That's not my role, unfortunately. Yes. I know that you don't have the final decision. Thank you, Matt. So one of the questions I have, um, just centering on the, the handgun freeze, you know, currently um, I could go and visit my local gun range. I don't have an RPAL. But if I'm under the supervision of someone who does hold an RPAL and I'm at the range, I can legally use the handgun under their direct supervision. Um, if C-21 to, were to pass as is, there would be nothing stopping the range from being a business owning a number of handguns, and people could still come to the range and legally use them under the supervision of a range master. Is that correct? Is that a, a correct interpretation of C-21? This is the proposal, is uh, that businesses will continue having the authority to own the handguns. Mm -hmm. And actually, it is one of the things that we are discussing right now to see how this could, uh, because there are comments we're hearing about elite sports shooter, and I heard earlier a question about that as well. So this is one of the ways that we're looking, but this will be defined later in regulation, but I'm okay. just explaining the consultations that are, are taking place right now mm -hmm. into are these kind of uh, options available for people to yeah, see so if they have interest or talent or So an individual may not be allowed to go and purchase one, but they could still go and use one under a controlled environment. In a business, yeah. yes. Okay. Good. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I, I also want to go back to, to Airsoft. Uh, I know this is a reoccurring theme, but 
uh, it shows that we as members of Parliament are getting a lot of correspondence on this issue as well. Um, I did ask the Minister a, a, a fairly technical question, and I think he indicated his willingness to have some consultations about how we work through this. But, but I have to go back to the, to the discrepancy I believe exists between the Public Safety Canada handout, which I have before me, and how Bill C-21 is written. Because if I look at the wording in C-21, if it were to pass as currently written, an airsoft that looks like the real thing is going to be deemed a prohibited device. But in your handout, uh, you say that current owners would be allowed to keep and use those that they already own. So how could a current owner use a prohibited device? That's, I'm wondering where the, how you square that circle. Well, I heard your question <laughs> earlier, and uh, it is the intent of the legislation to allow current owner to keep their air guns, in, sorry, air guns, yeah. Airsoft, yeah. Uh, airsoft gun. Yeah. And, uh, but I'll, I'm going to turn it to uh, Kelly, who is responsible of the CFO part. Thank you. Yeah, I would just add that uh, they can retain what they have, but going forward, the manufacturers would no longer be able to manufacture those those airsoft guns that uh, resemble real firearms. So they would have to be modified in some way going forward, in either color or. And this is the consultation um, that is happening right now with industry. Yeah, it's just if I were the owner of one, a current owner, and I'm, I, get, I get grandfathered by C21, if I were to read this bill and then suddenly I'm now in possession of a prohibited device because you have changed the definition, there's some pretty serious consequences with owning a prohibited device. Are, would I have some, like, would I be, would I feel at ease going out and using it even though it's now deemed a prohibited device? I guess this is the concern many in the community are having. Yeah, well, I was just saying, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this question, as uh, mentioned earlier, that there were a consultation with the Library of Parliament. Mm -hmm. I will have to get back okay. just to c confirm. I could confirm the intent of the legislation is as mentioned by the document we provided. Sure. sure. Uh, the tech briefing is to allow them, but I will have to discuss with some colleagues and uh, get back uh, to the committee with a clear answer. Mm -hmm. But that's the document that we provided because this is the intent of the legislation. Yeah. So, <laughs> And in my communications with uh, the Airsoft community, um, they have been trying to find some solutions to this, you know, uh, requiring a minimum age for purchase, uh, some kind of a license to purchase, uh, the requirement of an opaque bag in transporting so that, you know, from your place of residence to the Airsoft range, it's in an opaque bag, uh, the requirement of an orange tip, what are, what are, what's the department's position on some of these proposals? I'm sure you're getting the same correspondence I am. We are getting, uh, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are getting a lot of correspondences and we're looking at international best practices and we're s seeking advice from everybody to formulate uh, options for the minister. Mm -hmm. I can't say to the committee what the final decision will be, sure. but I could reassure that we are doing this work right now. And uh, again, like either the adding a color or two in some... Uh, other jurisdictions, they do that, are all considerations that the department is looking into. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, how much time do I have? Okay, and very quickly, um, Bill C-21 makes a specific reference to the Olympics and Special Olympics, a very elite level of shooting. Do you have a sense of how many people in Canada currently qualify at that level? Actually, what... Uh, we're working right now yeah. because this will be uh, uh, part of the regulations. We're working right now with Sports Canada mm -hmm. to clarify exactly how, who will be allowed and to describe it in regulation. And what we're doing right now is exactly gathering the numbers, who is at what level, and what implication provinces and territories will have as letter of recommendations or how the process will unfold to be allowed for our colleagues in the RCMP to uh, allow these people to be uh, owners of handguns. So all of this is exactly the kind of things that we're working on right now. And I just maybe want to remind, because earlier I heard multiple questions about the regulations. I heard multiple questions about the uh, uh, large capacity magazines. And all of these issues will be worked through regulations. And as the committee is fully aware, 
the Firearm Act is very specific on the requirement on the regulations for the firearm. And there is this exceptional measure of the 30 sitting days or referral to committee in both houses. So I just want to emphasize that it's important to know whatever is coming into force through regulations, and hopefully not two years, uh, will uh, be in in-depth consultations with not only the committee in both houses, but also with Canadians, with industry, whether it's for large capacity magazines, what kind of exemptions should be included or not, whatever recommendation is moving forward will be available for at least 30 sitting days, and all this information will be gathered and considered before moving forward with registration or... Thank you, sir. I'm going to have to carry on further. Sorry um, my question to you, Mr. Dacobob, but I'll also be to Deputy Commissioner Larkin and, and Ms. Paquette. Um, I think you'll agree with the principle that correlation does not equal causation. And that's why I was so astonished by what the minister said in his testimony, that the increase in legal registered firearm owners is causing an increase in gun violence in Canada. Do you, Mr. Dacobab, have any analysis or evidence to support that claim? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, I'm not here to defend or not what the minister is saying. But do you have frankly. that evidence? Uh, what we have as information is the increased number in the last 10 years of owners in Canada with handguns, over, I believe, 50 percent, Kelly, if I'm not mm -hmm. wrong, and the increased number of stolen handguns that are raised to our attention. I don't have the number in front of me, but what I could tell you is that's the data that we have available. Okay. Is there is an So it's not a direct connection that because there's more legal firearm owners means there's more, therefore there is more... I can't tell you if it's a direct connection or not. There's no but, evidence but from public safety. Thank you. Well, there uh, is a, oh, Deputy sorry. Commissioner Larkin, do you have any evidence to support that claim? Through you, Mr. Chair, to uh, Mr. Lloyd, again, we're focused on initiatives that will support public safety. Um, again, we don't have the correlation. We don't have that data. Okay. Um, we work within the legislative framework that is provided to us. Um, but thank again, you. our I approach... just wanted to know if you had the data, but thank you. Uh, Ms. Paquette, do you have that data? No, I don't have that data. Okay, so I guess the minister was speculating there. Um, my second question is um, to Mr. Dacobob. Uh, when we're embarking on a massive, possibly multi-billion dollar plan to buy back firearms and also to initiate a handgun freeze, I think Canadians would want to know that the department has done a study that the outcomes will lead to enhanced public safety. Does the department have such a study? or analysis that indicates that these programs will increase public safety? <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. I just want to clarify for the handgun part, uh, it's not only about gangs. It is partially, obviously, there's an important part, but there's the whole domestic violence, mm -hmm. and there's all the suicide uh, as well by handguns that are, we do have data about how committing or attempting to commit suicide with a gun increases significantly the death. And I, I just want to say, like, the way the department looks at it, it's really a holistic assessment that we do, and we look at the impacts for public safety Does throughout. Does your evidence show that this handgun freeze and the gun buyback will lead to enhanced public safety, or is that just something that you're speculating will happen if this is implemented? To be fair, I'm here to talk about C21, so I'm not in a position to talk about the buyback personally. But Or the handgun freeze, as I said. The handgun, as, I, as, as mentioned earlier, all guns are subject to risk. Mm -hmm. so I can't tell you exactly what, what uh, impact will have on specific. If but you I do have any studies, I would appreciate if you could submit those to the committee, maybe at a later date. I'd really appreciate looking over those. Um, my next question uh, for Ms. Paquette. Um, something that really concerned me was, and maybe you can provide some more insight, uh, C-21 includes a provision that says it will automatically revoke a registration certificate for a firearm after a reclassification has occurred. Won't this turn people who have legally owned registered firearms into automatic criminals? Why was this included in Bill C-21, and will there be a grace period as we've seen in the past? You want to answer why? I think Madame Paquette is asking me to answer that question because this is more a policy question than uh, uh, Thank you. an operational one. So it's not different right now than what it will be when there's a revocation of a firearm, and I think you could speak to the process itself. 
how are we going to proceed with that? So right now, if there's a revocation following a complaint or following a mishandling or a crime or an order from the court, mm -hmm. it will be exactly the same process, and the people will have to abide by the rules the same way as they're doing it right now, which I think Madame Bach People can, can who have it. been accused of anything, it just seems like part of the policy is the government can change the classification of a firearm from restricted to prohibited or non-restricted mm -hmm. to restricted. And this legislation is saying that their registration will automatically cease once that happens. So on paper, they will be in possession of an illegal firearm and thus a criminal. Um, so how can we avoid turning innocent people into criminals, paper criminals overnight? The government has option. And I think it was uh, done in uh, the OIC of uh, May 2020, where there was an amnesty order that okay. was provided as well. I'm not in a position to tell you what the government will do, but what I'm saying is what we saw in the past, it, 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 that's what happened to avoid a situation where people are from one day to the next criminal of owning a handgun that they owned legally uh, before. Thank you. Assistant Deputy Minister Daka, uh, sorry if uh, I pronounce your name improperly. Uh, Mr. Lloyd had asked for data uh, in regards to this. Could you please include... Uh, could you please include data on the coalition between gun ownership and suicide and domestic violence? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the question. Th that's exactly what I was mentioning. If the data we have is holistic data on all gun usage, mm -hmm. and we will be happy to provide whatever we have on uh, mental health, domestic violence, gender-based violence. I think it was mentioned earlier as well, there is a much higher risk if there is a gun in a violent environment that the gun will be used or there is a higher risk for the lives of, uh, especially women, to be honest, according to the data that we have. So happy to provide this data and the numbers that uh, we collect uh, globally for all the questions from the committee members. <clears throat> Thank you for your answer. Um, and I understand that uh, firearm owners involved in act of domestic violence or stalking will have their firearm license automatic, automatically revoked under Bill C-21. Could you explain the impact your department believes this will have on victims and survivors of domestic violence? Again, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, clearly, uh, m the committee here, and we follow your work very closely, uh, heard from a lot of groups about the importance of removing guns in a situation of domestic violence and the huge impact that it will have on the safety of anybody who's living in a domestic violence situation. And I could tell you the department as well meets with stakeholders wh who would like to meet with us and we collect this information and we are told that there is a significant impact when uh, in a domestic violence situation they know that the guns have been removed automatically following a complaint rather than having a complaint and being back in an environment where it's at high risk of usage of guns. So for sure, I could confirm that we are very aware of the positive impact that this will have on the well-being and the mental health of not only um, women, but also we heard from doctors. I think the committee heard from doctors in the past on uh, mental health cases as well, where they were struggling to remove the guns from them and ensure the safety of these individuals. Thank you. Thank you so much. Somebody shut me off. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Daklova. Uh, in regards to regulation uh, for guns, can you explain to this committee how this legislation will ensure that sports shooters are protected and able to continue competing in their sports? Because I have a lot of sports shooters and clubs in my riding that is concerned about this new Bill C-21. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I think I mentioned earlier uh, that we are working with Sports Canada and with the provinces and territories to ensure that we have clarity through the regulations on exactly what is required from these professional sports shooters. The threshold is high in the legislation. And as you know, uh, it is Olympic and Paralympic disciplines that will be included. But the details of uh, further information, how we can apply this, it will be coming through regulations. And uh, I could tell you that we are going to consult uh, as required 
for any regulations to clearly identify this and make sure that it is well understood by everybody who is in one of these disciplines. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Chair, do I have time for one more question? Okay, so I turn my attention to Deputy Commissioner Larkin. I understand that Bill uh, C-21 will make it an offense to alter a cartridge uh, magazine to exceed its lawful capacity and allow for wiretaps for this new offense. What impact do you think these measures will have on law enforcement agency focus it on, uh, focused on reducing firearm violence? Thank you. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, it's obviously that's one part of the. There was a resolution that was recommended by the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police through our working group. Um, our organization, the RCMP, were supportive of that. As we look at particularly around uh, curbing uh, gun violence, the alteration of magazines, uh, where we see, you know, in particularly our urban areas, that type of violence. I mean, it's unknown the potential uh, outcome. Obviously, we're hoping that it will also allow us in, in our investigations and with it, the opportunities around large-scale, uh, multifaceted joint force investigations where we're doing other types of covert operations that will actually be able to curb uh, the alteration of magazines and or seize more, uh, which hopefully has an outcome around public safety and the use of such. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to ask the Department a question about the criteria for sports groups at the level that my colleague was talking about. Thank you, uh, in advance for your answer, I know that you're still consulting groups. It's not clear in the current legislation where you have to be an elite athlete or simply a uh, um, member of, a, of a, a recreational club. And I know that this doesn't come under your jurisdiction, but I thank you for your clarification that you provided a little bit earlier. But I find it unfortunate, all the same, and this isn't a question, but more of a comment. You say that we're going to do more to control firearms, but in 2020, when we're, the consultations are still not finished. I know, that's not your, I know that's not your fault, but I feel that I have to bring this up because as legislators, we have to make decisions. We don't have all the tools on, in hand to do that. That's disappointing. In the bill... In the regulations that have to come, that will be coming into force, uh, you talked about uh, future regulations for um, large capacity um, cartridges, n no more than five bullets uh, in the magazine, not more than ten uh, cartridges for um, a handgun, and when we go through all of this, we, well, when we go through the testimony, some gang uh, witnesses have said it would be very easy to get a, um, a manufacturer to change and just make uh, firearms uh, that only have uh, five uh, uh, bullets in the cartridge. So you talked about complementary regulations that will be coming later on. What do you think of that? Thank you very much. You have a lot of questions in your comment. I would say that, first of all, the, the way that we, our consultations are undertaken is that as follows. I, I can't really start the consultations until there's royal uh, assent. For the time being, our consultations are focusing on the, are more broad in nature, because if this bill is is approved by Parliament and gets royal assent, we, well, well, we do have some data for that. But unfortunately, as you know, C-21, this is the second time uh, we've been dealing with this, but we can't really undertake any official consultations on the regulations unless we get uh, proper authority to do so. So I hope that Just so. The clause, clause 43, which is creating that new section 97.1, the, the part of this bill which specifically makes mention of the International Olympic Committee or the International Paralympic Committee. Now, it does make mention of other disciplines, and I understand that through regulations you're going to fill that in a bit more. I guess my question is, 
why did you take the approach to codify the Olympic Committee and the International Paraly Paralympic Committee in the bill, but then leave other disciplines open to interpretation in the regulations? Can you provide some rationale behind that? Thanks. Um, I can't really speak to the discussions that led to the decisions of the government to bring but don't you think the, it's the odd wording. that, like, like, there are two disciplines which are specifically named in the bill, which means there is no uh, leeway through regulations. It's going to be part of the act, but the others will be open to a bit more interpretation based on your consultations. Well, I could clarify that the intent of the legislation, as it's drafted right now in front of Parliament, is to limit and to freeze the mm -hmm. handguns. So I think, to be clear, the exemptions, which is saying it itself, it will be exempting some people from yes. the law, was clearly described in the law mm -hmm. to provide guidance and to earlier points to provide the committee and the parliament with clarity on what is the intent of the government. Thank you. And I'm sorry to cut you off because <laughs> I have less than a minute left. Okay. Um, on May 30th, when the minister made the announcement for Bill C-21, he also very clearly identified the fact that the government wanted to bring forward an amendment to capture some assault-style rifles which had escaped. Um, can you inform this committee um, what specific section of Bill C-21 you're seeking to amend? What, what's it going to look like so we can have some head up, head up notes on this? I think the only thing I could say is you heard the same thing as me on the TV from the minister and I cannot okay. comment any further on <laughs> that one. I'm okay. sorry about that. Well, thank you for clarifying. I'll, I'll leave it there, Chair. Uh, I have a lot of constituents who are concerned about the handgun freeze. Uh, they might own handguns and we're planning to transfer them to their children or grandchildren uh, or who have just recently obtained their RPAL license and are hoping to buy a handgun because they're sport shooters, enthusiasts. Um, can you assure all these people that if they have their application in for a transfer uh, before the regulation kicks in, that their transfers will actually be processed? I'll take this one, if yes. you allow me, Mr. Chair, because this is part of the uh, policy work. So the regulation is uh, actually, I believe today was the end of the 30 sitting days for the regulations. Could be. Uh, I could tell you the regulations will be uh, publicly available probably shortly. I can't tell you exactly when yet. I don't even know. But uh, what I could say is in the legislation, there was uh, clarity on transitional provisions. I, I can't tell you for the regulations yet because, as I said, after the 30 days, we work on it with the, whatever comments we got. But I could confirm that in the C-21, there are transitional provisions to that effect. Good. Thank you. Um, another question. Just to follow up on Mr. McGregor's line of questioning about the Olympics and the Paralympics, I have a letter here in front of me from a constituent who says, and I'll quote, I'm a local elite com uh, elite." athlete competing in the sport of International Practical, uh, Practical Shooting Confederation. Mm. And he is concerned that his sport or his confederation will be excluded by the wording in the bill. Uh, can, can you give any assurance to Mr. Gordon that indeed there will be consultations uh, with the public so that he can make a presentation about why his organization should also be part of the exemption? I can't guarantee that uh, personally, but I'm pretty sure if the committee would request to talk to them. But we will be consulting. And usually, I, can, I can't tell you exactly how the consultation is going to take place yet, but usually we have open forum and now technology allows everybody. And as I said earlier, I am already getting a lot of letters that I consider them as part of the consultation we have to work on from citizens across Senator the country. Larkin, uh, one of the sections in C-21 says that it's creating a new offense, and the offense is to alter a magazine to hold more than the legal number of rounds. And yet it's already an offense to possess a magazine that has more than the legal limit of rounds. So this proposed new offense seems to duplicate an offense that already exists. Why was this included in the legislation? It's a policy piece. Do you want to grab it? Uh, I'm being told again. It's a policy piece, so if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, I'll take that one. So actually, right now, it, there is a requirement. Um, 
I, and apologies for my very simplistic way of describing this, but I do it for my own understanding as well, is right now there is a way to uh, stop to five or ten, right, to pin it, exactly. And um, it's a requirement. What is added as an intention in this bill is altering because what was reported to our attention is some people because right now it's really just a pin could be easily changed mm -hmm. so they purchase it and then they change it and this is the part that was not an offense yet so they want to in ensure in the bill that it is and, and yet the act of removing a pin means that you are now in possession of a cartridge that can hold more than the legal round so you would be committing a criminal offense if you're removing a pin so why do we need to create a new offense for something that's already illegal? It's like saying it's illegal to murder somebody, but we're making a new act to say it's illegal to commit the act of murdering somebody. Actually, it's 5 for 10, if you may allow me. I don't want to go into too many details, but the alteration cannot be done if C-21 become a law. Right now, I don't know, probably you're aware that there are some cartridges that could be used for multiple guns and some of them could be removed to be on a 10 that is allowed in the law right now. Mm -hmm. This alteration will not be allowed unless it's done, like obviously unless it's authorized by our colleagues or done for the proper guns. So right now there's kind of a gap to uh, be addressed. 10 seconds. Okay. Well, I've got 10 seconds left, but thank you for that explanation. It was illuminating. Thank 2021. 173 women were killed um, by either present or former intimate partners. 40% of those were killed using guns, uh, or just about 40%. Now, uh, Deputy Commissioner Larkin, you've been the chief of police in Waterloo. You are here now in your capacity as somebody with a lot of policing experience. Do you believe that had Bill C-21 been in effect earlier, some of those lives would have been saved? Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, we do know that obviously uh, there's a chance, a five time greater chance of a fatality involving in intimate partner violence when there's a firearm uh, presence. So it's very difficult to, to surmise what could have been prevented or not. Um, again, you know, our organization and I believe our policing profession support initiatives that will enhance uh, public safety. But in particular, when we look at intimate partner violence in Canada, uh, we have a significant amount of work to do. Uh, particularly the pandemic uh, exasperated the in, in intimate partner violence from coast to coast to coast. And so, you know, naturally anything that we see as a progressive uh, piece of policy that may uh, ensure the safety of a uh, intimate partner violence, whether that uh, particularly, uh, generally speaking, uh, females, um, is a, a positive step forward. And so, again, you know, it's important to note that uh, there's a greater chance of five times of an intimate partner violence fatality when there's a firearm in the home. So that being said, it's something that you want to evaluate and monitor as we, with any public policy or legislative change, uh, the outcome will be once we see that change. But it is fair to say, based on your comments, that fewer guns in homes means likely fewer gun deaths. Well, again, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, when you look at the actual data, uh, particularly around family violence, we do recognize that the reduction of firearms in the home potentially can lead to a safer uh, residence, a safer family, familial situation. And thank you. Uh, Mr. Dacklebab, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that from a policy perspective as well and any of the data or research that you've seen. I think my colleague mentioned that there is obviously a link between guns and, and uh, gender-based violence. There is no doubt about it from a policy perspective, we're very clear on that aspect. And I think automatically when there's a risk, when we eliminate the risk, I can't tell you what numbers it's going to be in the future, but I am sincerely hopeful that it will help significantly the situation that we're in right now. Thank you. Now, it wouldn't be fair that we would go this entire meeting, Mr. Gaspar, without us at least turning our attention to you a little bit. So almost off the hook, but not quite. You know. Uh, CBSA officers um, have uh, apprehended uh, at the border uh, ghost guns, uh, 3D printed firearms, so on and so forth. And this is obviously, importation is obviously a, a serious concern. Um, in my earlier question to the minister, I talked a little bit about this. Could you share your perspective from the CBSA's point of view, how this will actually 
um, how Bill C-21 can or will or should um, help address this issue? Yeah, and again, I have to be a little careful because it, it's certainly a bit of a policy question. I can tell you that what C-21 does is it codifies and cohesively brings together the overarching approach that the government and certainly all members of the public safety portfolio have been doing for a number of years now, starting with the initiative uh, to um, um, address guns and gangs violence, and that is to take a multi-pronged approach. So C-21, as uh, my colleague Tadal has indicated, takes a look at the root causes and takes a look at uh, initiatives that can be put in place to protect the most vulnerable members of society from a policy perspective. And then w what it does is it uh, underscores the kinds of investments that we've been making to support those types of outcomes as well through the budget 2021 provisions and those and the uh, and the 2018 guns and gangs funding which is intended to uh, improve investigative capacity, better liaise with our international partners, identify where the source of import threats uh, exists. And I would, I guess I'd have to underscore that point more than anything else. You know, it, it's not unlike any other kind of smuggling regime. The sooner, the further upstream in the import stream that you're able to identify the threat and interdict with it, the more likely you are to be successful. Um, so I think if we look at it holistically, that's the key benefit of C21 from a border effectiveness perspective is that it brings together that cohesive approach to a multi-pronged uh, solution to address gun violence in Canada. Thank you all, and I'd like to thank all the witnesses for being here and for, for uh, I know it's been a little extra time, and I appreciate that. I'd also like to thank all of our staff, our interpreters and, and the technical staff for bearing with us this extra time. And uh, with that, I believe we have a will to adjourn, so uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.